Valentine's Day is the day for love. Somewhere along the lines in the village of Lower Quinton in Warwickshire, England, the memo of love got lost. Somebody would use this day, a significant day in other circles, to commit a brutal murder in the name of suspicion, age-old beliefs, or greed. Welcome to Bad Things, and today's video on what has been called the last witch killing in the United Kingdom. Surprisingly, this case isn't set in medieval times as you would suspect, but just a few months short of the end of the Second World War in 1945. Stay tuned for what Bad Things thinks most likely happened in this strange case. The British Isles, particularly England, has had a long and tainted history of witches and witch hunts, and the Cotswolds, the mountainous region of south-central England, where Lower Quintin is situated, has a well-earned historical and modern reputation for the practice of witchcraft. From at least the 10th century forward, hundreds of people in England and Scotland were accused of witchcraft, convicted and executed, the last being a Scottish woman named Janet Horn, who was burned at the stake in 1727. But Janet Horne was not the last witch to be hauled into court. In 1944, two elderly women, Helen Duncan and Jane York, were subjected to full criminal proceedings in London's Old Bailey and sent to prison under the 1735 Witchcraft Act. Duncan's followers allege she was caught and incarcerated by the military for fear of her revealing the secret invasion plans for D-Day, which she apparently obtained through extrasensory techniques. Throughout centuries in England's tiny communities, local witches or suspected witches were often dealt with directly and outside of the bounds of law. In 1945, Charles Walton would face this direct vigilante justice for allegedly being a warlock. Charles Walton, a 74-year-old farm worker, lived in a modest house with his 33-year-old niece, Edith, whom he had adopted 30 years earlier after her mother died. Walton was a loner who didn't interact much with the other locals. He seemed to have been more at ease among animals and had established a reputation as a skilled horse trainer. He was not disliked in the community, but stories arose among his neighbors who said that wild birds ate out of his hand. Dogs became attracted to him, he raised huge toads and performed horse whispering, a dark art that enabled him to converse with animals. Some of his neighbors even blamed him for the past season's poor harvests. Between 9 and 9.30 a.m. on February 14, 1945, Charles was spotted leaving his cottage and walking through the village with his tools of his trade, a pitchfork and a slash hook, a curved blade on a pruning rod. Charles walked with a limp and always carried his cane with him. He was not permanently employed and sought out temporary farm labor whenever it became available. For some months, he had been working for Alfred Potter, who managed a farm called the Furs. Walton's job on that day was chopping back hedges in hill ground, a field on the slopes of Meon Hill. Potter described Walton as an inoffensive type of man, but one who would speak his mind if necessary. When Walton did not come home by the scheduled time that afternoon, Edith became concerned and asked a neighbor to accompany her to the Furs to search for her uncle. Edith caught up with Potter and inquired about her uncle's whereabouts. Potter said that he had not seen the elderly man for a few hours and went with Edith and her neighbor to check at the field where Walton had been working. What they found was a horrific sight. Charles had been smashed over the head, most likely with his own cane, and his neck had been sliced open with his slash hook. The pitchfork had been driven into the earth, with prongs on each side of Walton's neck pinning him to the ground, and the handle tucked into neighboring shrubs, most likely to hold it in place. The slash hook had been left in Walton's neck. Early descriptions of his wounds, which were not repeated later in the case, also said that a cross had been cut in his chest, most likely with the slash hook. This was not an uncommon wound in witch killings. Other reported witch killings in which people were murdered by others who felt they had been cursed or given the evil eye 
often featured a carved cross on the corpse of the deceased witch. The murder was so horrific and perplexing that local police decided to call in Scotland Yard. Chief Inspector Robert Fabian was sent from London to investigate. Fabian immediately began investigating people Walton interacted with regularly as potential suspects. When Fabian tried to interrogate residents about the incident, he was met with stonewall silence. When the locals did answer, they used as few words as possible. Some would not speak at all. The natives of Upper and Lower Quinton and the surrounding district are of a secretive disposition, he said, and they do not take easily to strangers, Fabian would recount. The tight-lipped residents, Italian prisoners of war, and British and American forces were all interrogated without results. Fabian then zeroed in on one probable suspect, Albert Potter. Inquiries indicated that Charles's employer was a dishonest and aggressive man. He was often late paying staff because he was reportedly embezzling funds and dividing the remaining cash among creditors to protect them from finding out. When questioned, Potter's account of the day changed multiple times during the interviews. In his statement, Potter said that he had been at a nearby pub with another farmer and left about midday to care for some animals. He added that when crossing the fields on his way back to the Furs, he saw Walton working around 500 yards away, but did not bother to talk with him. He stated he came home, read the newspaper for a little while, and then went outside to help another man working on the farm, before returning to the house for his midday lunch. His wife, unsurprisingly, collaborated his story. Specialists examined the pants Potter confessed to wearing on February 14th and discovered two marks on the front that were believed to be bloodstains. However, investigators found that the pants had been cleaned too extensively to allow for a definitive identification. Several locals also spoke out in favor of Potter's character, including a man named Harry Beasley, who worked on farms in the area and was known to be a friend of Charles. He told police that Potter had a reputation as a decent man to work for. Potter remained true to his statement for the rest of the inquiry, with the exception of some confounding information. Fabian considered Potter the prime suspect, but never gathered enough evidence to charge him. This is where the case takes a turn, to a little bit kooky and a lot of spooky. Any true crime enthusiast knows that when there are no answers, the crazy theories come out. Early in his investigation, Fabian came upon a book published in 1929 by the Reverend James Harvey Bloom, vicar of a church in the adjacent community of Whitchurch. Reverend Bloom wrote in his book, Folklore, Old Customs and Superstitions in Shakespeare Land, that in 1885, a local plowboy called Chairs Walton was approached by a phantom black dog three nights in a row, including one night when the dog was accompanied by a headless woman. On the same night, Walton learned that his sister had died. Charles Walton would have been 15 years old at the time the book was published, so he could well have been the boy in the book. However, evidence contradicts this view. For one thing, he had no sister, who died in 1885. Fabian also discovered that many in the community believed that February 14th corresponded in the old Julian calendar to the date of Imbolc, a pagan festival that marks the start of spring, and that Imbolc was the best day for a blood sacrifice to help the earth recover from the hardships of the recent winter. Hardships which were blamed on Charles. But how did Charles cause this crop failure? The rumor went that he had captured a toad, fastened a miniature plow to its legs, and released the amphibian to wreak havoc on the local crops and cause illness in the farm animals. Some rumors also asserted that Charles was descended from a long line of witches and warlocks. Anne Tennant was killed by James Hayward in September 1875 in neighboring Long Compton. Hayward had confronted the 79-year-old woman and stabbed her to death with a pitchfork, believing she was a witch. It was an old custom that a witch be executed in this manner. Seventy years later, 
The same tragedy befell her supposed descendant, Charles Walton. Furthermore, Fabian felt that the location of Charles's murder on the edge of Meon Hill appeared to be significant in the occult theory. The area had a rich history of strange tales. These legends included one about the Celtic king Arwen's phantom hounds hunting on the hill at night. Lower Quinton is also within a few miles from the Rollwright Stones, which are comparable and older than Stonehenge, but considerably smaller. Rollwright was a popular pagan hangout, and on May 12, 1949, four years after Walton's murder, two women reported seeing a witch's gathering with shadowy figures dancing in a queer fashion and bouncing up and down, mumbling a chant and following a leader dressed in a goat face mask. So where do we, the Bad Things crew, stand on what most likely happened to Charles Walton? Clear-cut murder or hoodoo voodoo? It may be a little bit of both. Alfred Potter's actions after the murder strongly indicated his involvement in the crime. Potter ran the furs on behalf of his father's company. Because labor was in scarce supply during the war, Potter used to hire local casual laborers to keep the farm running smoothly. Charles was usually happy to carry out such tasks since his retirement income of 10 shillings per week barely covered his living expenses. Potter told investigators that he often paid Walton for hours that he had not worked. This was the first of several inconsistencies in his statement. In reality, Potter was paying Walton and two other workers less than he had claimed from his father's firm and pocketing the difference. Fabian was aware of this as well as Potter's failure to pay numerous workers, including Charles, on time. Following the murder, both surviving workers quit Potter's employment, most likely realizing that Potter had something to do with the murder. Potter tried to shift the blame to the fascist Italian prisoners of war in the area, but their involvement was quickly dismissed. Potter even acknowledged handling the murder weapons at the crime scene when the body was found. Was this done to provide him with an alibi in case fingerprint evidence was discovered? No such forensic evidence was found, but we must remember the faint blood stains discovered on the trousers he had been wearing on that day, despite extremely thorough cleaning by his wife. There are strong indications that Potter was the culprit, and no doubt knew that Charles was seen as a warlock of some sort in the village. This could have been a perfect cover for murdering Charles over unpaid wages or damaging information Charles possessed concerning his embezzlement of company funds. Charles, by today's accounts, would have been labelled as an animal lover who had a special gift with nature, not a witch. Alfred Potter used old wives' tales, superstition and ignorance to commit a murder that he would never be held accountable for. Leave us a comment and tell us what you think. Clear-cut murder or hoodoo voodoo? And want to support the channel? Feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.